Security is a journey, not a destination. Instead of just regurgitating what every other YouTuber out there says, we're going to actually dive into things that people don't talk about on YouTube that typically I view as a big security threat and a vulnerability. So for those people out there that are concerned about privacy or concerned about security, this video is for you. And no, I'm not going to try and sell you a damn VPN. <laughs> So let's let's get into it. I'm going to first talk about hardware vulnerabilities. It's probably the most overlooked and one that we need to talk about. This is like Intel Management Engine. And you can see there's a ton of security vulnerabilities. There's a ring negative three exploit. And if you're unfamiliar with like the, the ring topology, typically how operating systems work, there's these three rings. There's the kernel that's loaded first, device drivers, and so on and so forth. Ring negative three is actually Intel ME engine. Uh, it's It actually has multiple different rings, but the one that exploited is negative three was actually right in the center because it's actually below zero. So it's actually got higher privileges than your operating system. And to probably illustrate this, so you kind of get a good visualization of how malicious this can be, but also exploitive and how a lot of people could probably hack into your system is to actually look at open source project called mesh central now i've used this i love it i don't obviously use it for malicious purposes but i highly encourage any intel users out there to install it it's an npm node package and i've used it for processors with vpro to get out of band access now what's out of band access it's stuff to where even if your computer's logged off and turned off as long as there's some kind of power to that system and an internet access, I can log into your system, even with the computer being off. It's kind of insane, but I use it all the time in a server environment, but also in business. And Mesh Central is great. Now, initially when Intel set this up, they partnered with Real VNC, and there was this really convoluted way of setting up vPro, but Mesh Central came along and made this so much more streamlined. Why I tell people to actually go and install this is because they do have like a firmware update section in here to where when you launch into Mess Central and you register your Intel system, it'll actually look to see if your firmware has an exploit on it and if you need to update because a lot of people don't update their firmware and uh, this uh, has some really cool capabilities. And if you want to set up out of band access for remote, this does it great. It's way better than the official Intel way uh, using using real VNC. So a huge, huge shout out here. But at the same time, if I was a security or privacy nut, uh, yeah, that, that would concern me that it doesn't matter what operating system I install, Linux, Windows, Mac. Uh, a lot of times this can happen uh, with Intel processors, which is uh, kind of wild uh, just to think about. Now, AMD also has their version of this which is called AMD Platform Security or PSP. Uh, less vulnerabilities have come out about AMD's version. So I, I'm hesitant to say it's more secure, but uh, less documentation for sure. In the server realm, if you've ever dealt with servers, there's Dell's iDRAC, which also has out-of-band access, and then HP's uh, ILO, or, or Lights Out, as it's called, for that. So you can access these systems with them being turned off. So hardware access, it's kind of wild that we talk about this, but most people don't even realize how vulnerable their system can be, especially if they've never even patched it. Now, next up is operating systems. This is a really cool one. I'll, I'll throw a little diagram on the screen here. Cubes is my recommendation. Now, every other YouTuber talks about Tails OS because it's it's the easiest one to understand. It's just uh, one that loads from a CD or, or USB drive. And once you shut it down, it, it flushes everything from memory and it's fine. But I like Cubes the best. And even Edward Snorton uses Cubes OS or, or Snowden, Snorton. <laughs> but uh, Cubes OS is really neat because of how it's compartmentalizes. You launch into... A browser and Windows you can you can launch that as a separate VM and that's an isolated instance and then when you're done it just can wipe that entire thing so there's not a lot of crosstalk and they even compartmentalize parts of the system so depending on what part of the system in and that might not talk to the other part the downside to compartmentalization is it's hard and complicated. So if you're not a technical person, there's no way you're gonna be able to make cubes work for you. Therefore, Tails OS is why most YouTubers do it because it has the highest uh, 
chance of a normie being able to do it. But I would say normies can't even properly secure their system, so what's the point? I, I guess to minimize the footprint, but at the same time, uh, you should be aware of these types of things. Like when you are got a bunch of different uh, tabs open like I do here, a lot of times there can be a lot of crosstalk between them. Uh, Facebook is notorious for reading cookies and those types of things from other browsers. That's why you use VM in compartmentalization as a, an option to where you're not signed in to hold a whole bunch of different places because if you use Tails OS and you launch into a browser and then open up 20 different tabs, uh, are you really that much more secure because you're signed into all these places and they they do talk to each other? So uh, that's one thing I would like to say with operating systems. Another thing I caution people like Windows is probably definitely the most problematic with as all their CVEs or, or, or vulnerability exploits out there being like a lot of remote execution, which is definitely a high severity compared to a lot of the other ones from like Linux and Mac, which are to lesser severity. But at the same time, uh, when it comes to Linux, it is not a, hey, I installed Linux, I am now secure. Because like I'm using Arch Linux here. I don't have very many packages and I'm just using kind of a base install. But this doesn't have like, you. I don't, do I even have UFW? Yeah, I don't even have a firewall installed. So this system's pretty exposed. I would even say more exposed than a Windows system by default. So that means that, uh, I would probably be more secure with a Windows install than I would a vanilla Arch install with no packages on it because I haven't even installed a firewall. So there's those types of things and uh, you should know about that. Just because you have one operating system doesn't necessarily mean you're more secure. However, installing a security-based operating system like Cubes, I've done a couple videos on it. Highly recommend you check that out if you're interested in more of the security privacy side of things. But uh, that's my take on the operating system front. As far as browsers go, ah, I don't want to recommend you a browser. A lot of the security privacy browsers, I think like Waterfox and some other ones, are kind of older forks of Firefox. And there's some scripts out there that kind of de-bloat Firefox. Those might be a little bit better than my stock Brave, but then you run into compatibility issues. And I think... When it comes to browsers, like I said, there's not one I'd recommend, but you always have to think about security and convenience. They're two different things. You can't be highly convenient and have a high security. Typically, the more convenient it is, the less secure you are. The more secure you are, the less convenient it is. Next up is going to be password managers. Now, password managers are something that uh, I would highly recommend, but a lot of times uh, I'm, I'm a bit lazy on my password manager, so I actually have an online one. I wouldn't recommend it. Do as I say, not as I do type of thing, because right now I think I'm using RoboForm. But I would recommend probably Bitwarden, as they do have a FIDO device. If you have like a YubiKey or the type of thing, you can self-host this on like a secure server at your house, so it's not up in the web, and then authenticate it with physical device access. So if you have a keychain, you can toss it on there. And that way someone new login might come into your, your password manager. Uh, they And let's say they get your username and password, they'd still need that hardware device to activate it and log in and start filling out passwords. Super important. Um, obviously for me, I do have two factor on, but it could always be better. And I still think self-hosting at like a, a secure site for those that are really security and privacy conscious, really important. So I really love Bitwarden. You could also use KeePass as well. This is also a self-hosted one, open source, great FOSS one. Uh, those are the only two I recommend right now, even though I'm using a different one. Uh, it's just moving all this stuff is kind of a pain and something that I will probably tra slowly transition to. But right now, if I had to choose one, it'd probably be Bitwarden and I'd probably use a, a physical key with it uh, for my two-factor. There's other forms of two-factor. You could do it through SMS. You could do it through uh, another, you know, digital key. But again, having that physical device for the two-factor, I think is super important, especially for your password manager. And probably the final thing and the most important of all these is your network. Hey, how is your network? When it comes down to 
are people even able to get in to talk to your computer? That's the big thing. Like if they're able to talk to a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of different devices, maybe that unsecured IoT fridge that's never been updated with firmware from five years ago that you bought from Samsung, that got hacked, that, 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 that can be a possibility. But if they can't get into your network, they can't talk to your, your smart fridge. Uh, so big thing, check to see this. I, I like to use grc.com with just a shields up. Usually this gives you a little basis of what's going on and it can run a full port scan. There's other ways of doing this, but I feel like this is the best way that everyone can kind of just see. We'll just go ahead and do proceed and just see what the basic profiling of my network is. Now, typically you will get some uh, knowledge and explicit permission. That's fine. Uh, I'll, I'm just going to go ahead and do, let's look at the first 1056 ports and just see what all those ports are. Do I have any open points? Hopefully all this is green as I don't typically open up any ports for my home network. But if you do get a red or blue, it means that that could be an attack vector. Someone could remote into this static IP right here, which hopefully I've blurred out on the video and someone could attack my network. So this is the entire first 1,055 point, uh, ports that were scanned. Uh, overall, it took a little over a minute for GRC to run this analysis. Everything passed, nothing was open or closed or responding. And that's the big thing here. Now, sometimes let's say you're hosting a web server from your house, that's gonna be like port 80 or port 443 is gonna be open for you. Or let's say you have an SSH server, that's gonna be open. but. If you're not hosting and you don't want any outside access, it should look like this. It should not have anything forwarded to your internal network. This is really important. Other portions that uh, I could do better in mine is even making sure no ping responses. Sometimes there's like an ISMP uh, response where, you know, uh, on your actual gateway router from your ISP, they configure it by default to respond to ping requests that says, hey, I'm here, attacker. You can go ahead and do a scan or whatever it might be uh, because I'm, I'm a real thing. And if you disable that response when they go and hit you and go, hey, are you a person? Since you're designated not to respond, it'll just be like nothing. They'll just get blank air and then they'll move on to the next target. Because at the end of the day, most hackers, they hack out of opportunity, not... Um, you know, targeted most times, you know, there definitely there are some very gifted hackers that can do targeted hacks, but many times it's just a wide port skin. And then they find the easy prey, especially on big networks. I'd be very cautious of like hotel networks and big public networks that have a variety of uh, attack vectors and users on it that could be easily infiltrate your computer as you don't control the gateway. But for your home, run this. It'll help. And the probably the last thing I'm going to mention is this. Don't be stupid. That's the, that's the biggest problem I see in modern computing is most people think they're more secure than they really are. I never think I am secure. There's always another layer. There's always something more I can do. And it's, again, a journey, not a destination. It's something that you should be aware of when you're doing things. As far as VPNs, I'll just put a little blurb here at the end. Uh, they're really good if you're in like a public network. Establish a VPN, even if it's a VPN to your home, that means all the traffic will be coming from your home and you'll you'll protect yourself better on those public networks. But uh, pass for like paying for a VPN and stuff like that. Uh, there's only, well, there's two reasons I could see for paying a VPN. Torrents and geo unlocking. That's that's basically it. And that's the reason why people use VPNs. It has nothing to do with security or privacy. And that's just my two uh you know, two tidbits about VPNs here at the end. And uh just be a, a more a casual user don't think that hey i installed this extension or i installed this piece of software this antivirus this internet suite now i'm now i'm secure i can go do as much stupid stuff as i want no you'll still get infected those softwares are just layers of security in in the grand scheme of things so think of it in this typology that i went through today from the gateway the network to the actual hardware itself, to the actual operating system you're running, to your browser, your browser extensions, your software that's installed on your computer. All these are different layers of, 
a, a grand scheme of security to have a secure system. And for me personally, I want to leave you with this, Jim. I ordered this a couple months ago. It's a Risk Five Dev Term, a, you know, basically a, a mini PC of sorts that I kind of wanted to try out. That doesn't use AMD or Intel, and Risk Five is completely open source. So I'm really kind of curious to see this. This would be the securest of all secure terminals, <laughs> albeit a bit slower than the Intel AMD counterpart. So I'll have fun. I'll probably make a video about this in the future, but at least wanted to make this one just overviewing what I think a secure system is. So with that said, let me know what I missed down in the comments and I'll see you in the next one.